Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 12067 Environmental Law. We're in week 11 of Term 3 2017. Well, we really are at the pointy end of the course. The examination is next week. I'm going to start by providing some information about the examination. This replicates what I've placed on the landing page of Moodle. I've placed it in a news forum and also through UCrew. However, if you've got connectivity problems, we might, um, I might add it as a Word document and that might assist you um, even further. So let me share the screen and we'll look at the Moodle page to see what I've um, uploaded at this stage. So you should now see the landing page for Moodle for this subject. First thing I notice in the top left hand corner, only four out of 48 responses for have your say. I really would appreciate if um, you could take a few minutes to upload your responses to have it say, have your say. That is very important for me. It's very important for the university. And um, if you do that, you can go into the draw to win an iPad or a number of um, calls via my vouchers. So please click the button, have your say. So moving down the landing page, under the familiar area where I upload the most recent seminar. By the time you, for those watching this as a recorded session, uh, this is where you'll find um, week 11 by the time you get to it. Uh, below that, you will see hopefully now the examination content. Um, I'm told that on small screens, it's very difficult to read this. So I will upload it as a Word document as well. And welcome Justice, I'm glad you joined us. I'm sorry that we had some technical issues there before. So, oh, thanks, John. <laughs> thank you, Justice. So, here we have the examination content. I'm saying examination, but I don't really mean it. What I really mean is take home paper. And uh, I must stop calling it an examination because technically it's not. So, what's it all about? Well, the first thing is it's worth 50 marks. It is released. I will release it on Friday, the 9th of February. So, that's Friday week at 5 p.m. that's Queensland time and you are to upload your response within a window of only three hours by 8 p.m. Please don't be late because the system will lock you out and if it locks you out it means that I can't accept the work. This is an, a take-home paper with a sting. The sting is you have three hours to complete the task and there is no opportunity for late submission. So the usual rule that might apply for an assessment in term, uh, being if you're late by a day, I'll deduct 5%, that doesn't apply for this one. So there's no opportunity for a late penalty of 5% and you'll receive a mark for zero if you don't upload by 8 p.m. So ideally you'd try and upload a little before 8 p.m. If you have technical or other difficulties, send me an email or phone me and uh, I'll try to deal with it there and then. Submit your work through Moodle in the usual manner. And as always, for me, I request a single Word document, not PDF, and don't submit in multiple parts. There are two parts to this assessment in broad terms. The first worth 35 marks with a limit of 1,500 words relates to a hypothetical scenario it will cover certain things that I've asked you to reflect on during the previous 12 weeks. And in essence, your task is to prepare an advice, applying environmental law, and as you see fit, refer to legislation, case law, principles, procedures, regulations, or rules in answering the problem. Part B is a very standard essay style question where it's worth 15 marks and the word limit is 500 words. Now, you might be, you might be saying to yourself, well, how on earth do I get to generate 2,000 words in a three hour assessment? Um, oh, and Justice says, Queensland time, no daylight saving. Is that right? Daylight savings finished by then? Uh, not in Queensland, we don't do daylight savings. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. no, that's right. So, yeah. so yeah. Queensland. South um, Wales, we are yes. Paddy and um, yep. Victoria. Okay, good. So, at the moment in Queensland time where I am, it's 7.15 p.m. 
um, of, is it 8, 8 15 pm where you are in New South Wales? All right. So just bear that adjustment in mind and make sure that you're online ready to go at the correct time. Because if you say I logged on an hour late, um, you probably won't get much sympathy. I'm sorry. All right. So you're probably saying, how can I possibly generate 2000 words within a, a window of three hours only? I normally have two weeks to do an assessment piece like that. Well, what I'm going to ask you to do is prepare and be ready to have your material mapped out. To do that, I'm going to give you some guides as to what this is all about and uh, narrow the um, target. So you can pre-prepare a lot of your material um, if you wish. All right, let's share the screen again. Go back to the assessment task that, we, um, that I have set for you. You should see the Moodle page. Please let me know if that's not the case. And um, you'll see that it's in the two parts. We have the time limits with the word count. I'm always flexible on word count. Other unit coordinators may not be so flexible, but I generally am. If you happen to go over the word count, I will check to see if you've used the words wisely. Um, I just don't let, allow you to waffle or add irrelevant material. But if I believe that you've um, uh, written the material in a concise manner and what you've added to go over the word count is worthwhile, then you won't be penalised. Now, extensions, if you do find that you need an extension, you'll have to apply in the usual manner and you'll have to, to um, do so before the um, start of the quiz or the um, online assessment. All right, so that's the material to give you an idea of what it's all about. and. Um, I will give you some more information about that shortly. I'll just shop, stop that share. And what I propose to do is to um, give you very specific information now about Part A. So Part A deals with a hypothetical advice. I'll present you with a question in a form that I use quite often, and that is placing you, as, as it were, in a position where you're required to provide advice. Now, that advice that you give will be to one of two types of litigants. The first is a community litigant. The second is a regional council. When you think about it, most of the cases, if not all the cases that you've considered, have three potential litigants. You have an applicant or a proponent of a development. You have a, a, a regulatory authority, which would usually be the assessment manager, which would normally be the council, or it would be a, um, a community member. So whether that's a submitter or, or a community member in relation to uh, some other form of litigation. So what I'm saying to you now is that when you read part A, you won't be asked to give an advice to a developer or a proponent. You'll be asked to give advice to either a council or a community litigant. The idea is that you give broad detail about what they need to consider in, in embarking in litigation or, or some other form of resolution of the dispute and give them some advice about the broad principles. Now, if the matter relates to town planning issue, for example, I don't expect you to have detailed knowledge of, um, of, of town planning uh, documentation, but if you can access that material and refer to it, then by all means, so much the better. That's if it's a town planning type issue. But you'll know now that when you're preparing for the examination, look at your reading as if you're being asked to give an advice to a council or if you're being asked to give advice to a community litigant. We have talked about issues to do with councils and the executive. Last week, we talked a fair bit about compliance issues. What would you do if you are advising a client or you're working in, a, in an organisation which is regulatory by nature. You're dealing with an issue, how do you go about the process of responding to those issues? I'll narrow the, um, uh, in, 
I'll narrow the, the focus of your study even further and say that if the question that I ask you to consider in part A requires you to advise a council, it will be in relation to a regulatory matter. So think about what it is that a council can do to deal with issues of concern to it. If on the other hand, the question that I asked you to consider in part A is advice to a community litigant, then I will ask you to consider it from a Commonwealth perspective. And that is, what are the procedures that a community litigant can undertake in order to enforce environmental laws that are Commonwealth based? So what I've tried to do here is this. If it's dealing with a council, your procedures will be state-based. If you're dealing with a community litigant, your procedures will be, uh, or the legislation will be Commonwealth-based. So in this course, I've tried to cover international law, Commonwealth law or federal law, state law and council law. And that's been reflected in the cases and the commentary and the legislation that you've seen. So either council and state uh, jurisdiction, or it's going to be community litigant with a focus on some form of Commonwealth um, legislation. No surprise, that'll be the EPBCA. So tonight's focus is on the second, last week we dealt with regulatory authorities. Tonight, we're going to deal with um, community litigants. Some of the challenges that community litigants face in enforcing environmental laws. And um, I've got a few uh, things up on the screen that I can share with you that might provide you some guidance and assistance as you prepare for your um, examination. I haven't said much about part B. Part B is really just this. Part B is going to be just an essay style question and it can come from anywhere in the course, um, but I'll give you a hint. It will relate to, I'll come to that, I'll come to that. Um, now just a question about the first part of the assessment. Um, it will be one or the other. In part A, it will not be both. And I don't give you a choice. So you'll open the assessment and it will either be something about helping a council or something about helping a community litigant. One of the two, but it won't be both. Um, all right, so let's talk about community litigants and we'll look at this from the perspective of... Um, hey, yes, John. Justice. Yes, uh, Justice. I mean, in terms of legislation, do you have to apply uh, the state legislation uh, or the common legislation if it is in relation to a community litigant, or you can have a situation where both legislation applies? I couldn't follow the question, Justice, sorry. So you're talking about community litigants? Was that correct? Sorry, Justice, I, I couldn't follow your question. I'm sorry. I think you were asking about community litigants and litigation that apply. Oh, no. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Yes. All right. Okay. I think there was a problem with my <coughs> headphones. No, the question is whether uh, in terms of legislation, it has to be uh, Commonwealth or state legislation, or it can be both legislation being able to apply in the case. Oh, it can certainly be both. Um, so, yeah, and I don't want to mislead you with my hints and, and make, make them counterproductive. Um, so tonight, for example, when we're talking about community litigants, you'll see that um, the basic procedure is based on Commonwealth legislation, the EPBCA, but there are state procedures involved and that necessitates involving state legislation. So don't restrict your answer to just one piece of legislation. Um, but really what I'm trying to say is that the main focus will be um, either state or federal in terms of the overall impact. I hope that makes sense. In terms of dealing with community litigants, that'll become more apparent when we start to go through what I, what I want to show you, if that's okay. 
All right, so let's share the screen. Let's have a look at a website that I think is very useful. That is the Environmental Defenders Office website. I have previously shown you the Environment, uh, the Community Litigants Handbook, um, and that is uh, something that uh, is a little out of date, but uh, it is currently under production again. So a lot of good information on the EDO website about community litigants, and that might be a great resource for you as you prepare for your examination. Environmental law of I'm sorry, uh, the EDO has a couple of quick reference checklists. So here's a good practical checklist. If you um, are considering a planning appeal or dealing with issues about uh, planning appeals, that would be a good checklist for you to consider. Likewise, we have a checklist in relation to litigation generally and notices of appeal, etc. These are more in terms of matters that relate to dealing with development applications rather than necessarily enforcement type issues. The Environment Environmental Law Australia is an organisation that provides case studies of environmental litigation and um, simple explanations of environmental law in Australia. So Environmental Law Australia might be another place where you can consider looking for further information. So the main tool, the most powerful tool that a community litigant would have, um, I'm not sure if there are links in the material to those websites, but I'll ask you to try and find those. So the Environmental Defenders Office, Queensland, and there are in other states, that'll be dead easy to find. And from there, you'll be able to work your way through that uh, website. Now, the most powerful tool for a litigant generally at a preemptive stage is an injunction. Injunction is an order of a court asking for someone to stop doing something or essentially to force someone to do something. So the injunction can be prohibitive in nature, that is requiring a person, a respondent, for example, to refrain from taking action, or it can be a mandatory injunction application, which requires a respondent to take positive action. So you can understand that a community litigant has a very powerful tool available if they can obtain the order, if they can secure an injunction. So the idea of an injunction typically is from an environmental perspective to maintain an environmental situation until the court can make the final decision. The rationale behind seeking an injunction is to say, if we don't stop this now, then there's no point waiting two years for a court case because by then the rainforest will be lost, whatever it might be. So when we talk about an injunction, we are really talking, I suppose, another way of categorising it is, is it an interlocutory injunction or is it a permanent injunction? An interlocutory injunction is one where we are asking for something to stop until we get to the trial. A permanent injunction is an order of the court saying it can never happen. So largely our focus for an environmental community litigant wanting to take action to enforce some right on behalf of themselves or the general public would be to seek an interlocutory injunction. So how do you go about getting this interlocutory injunction and what do you have to prove? Well, you need to show that there is an arguable or if you like prima facie case to justify granting the injunction. And you must show that there are serious questions to try. The court will not consider granting an injunction unless it is of the view and it's convinced of, of, of the fact that this is a serious question that needs to be tried. The court will work on this basis. It will consider the balance of convenience. That's the paramount consideration in asserting the relative, relative interests and impacts of um, the parties. And one of the key issues here 
is one that we learned early on, probably week two or maybe week three, the precautionary principle, for example, or principles about environmental, um, uh, sustain, environmentally sustainable development. So if you can show that there are important environmental issues by perhaps referring to the um, precautionary principle and that there are substantial impacts and that there is a risk of environmentally um, uh, irreparable harm being caused and an award of damages would just not suit, then a court is more likely to consider um, granting an injunction. So what legislation and what section of legislation would we consider as a community litigant? Let's share the screen. Well, there's a question about specific performance. Yep. Sorry, John. Um, when you were just talking about that, so you were talking about not just an injunction, you were talking about an interlocutory injunction. Yeah, is which is a form of injunction, yes. Right. So, Okay, sorry. Thank you. Now, Justice asked about specific performance. Specific performance is a specific, is an order of the court compelling someone to do something in a particular context, usually a contract. So if you sign a contract to buy a property, the seller refuses to sell that property to you, then the appropriate action would be to seek an order for specific performance, which is an order effectively compelling the seller to proceed with the contract. So specific performance looks like an injunction, um, a mandatory injunction, but it's really contained within that commercial or contractual um, area. So it, you would not apply for a specific um, performance order if you're seeking um, redress as a community litigant, you'd be thinking injunction. Right, so let's share the screen and we'll go to hopefully the correct screen. Can you now see the Commonwealth Consolidated Acts? I've been very naughty here and I've pulled up um, Ostley. When you're in court or even in an assignment, um, if you are referring to legislation, you would normally refer to the authorised reports but Ostley is just fine and, it, and I like, it's very easy to use. So here we have section 1475, injunctions for contravention of an act. And you'll see that it says, if a person in, has engaged or engages or proposes to engage in conduct consisting of an act or omission that constitutes an offence, then the minister, an interested person, or a person acting on behalf of an unincorporated organisation may apply to the federal court for an injunction. The injunction can be a prohibitory injunction, which is subsection two, or it can be a mandatory injunction, which is subsection four. It can be an interim injunction, and there's reference there to who is an interested person you know, in the context of either an individual or organization. Um, so that gives the court power to grant the injunction and subsection three provides that if the court grants an injunction restraining a person from engaging in conduct and in the court's opinion, it is desirable to do so, the court may make an order requiring the person to do something, which includes repairing or mitigating damage to the environment. So the, the order that is available to a community litigant and others, I'm, I'm saying community litigant, but you'll read the act and it says others, including the minister, but I'm looking at this from the perspective of what can a community litigant do, is very wide. And you'll see that there's a very wide meaning to what is meant by an interested person or an interested person being an organisation. Remember, of course, one great thing about Ostley is the note up reference procedure. I'm sure you all know this, but if you click note up references and you'll see where the cursor was, you'll see a series of cases that relate to that section. Now, the case that I want to highlight tonight as the example case is the one that you'll see second on the list, and that is Booth and Bosworth. That was in a number of parts. We're going to start with the first part of the case, which was in 2000 in the Federal Court of Australia, which uh, the citation is 2000 FCA 1878 and you'll see the decision was handed down in the federal court on the 13th of December, 2000. So if we now click 
through to Booth and Bosworth, you'll see there's the report, again, it's through Ostley, um, <clears throat> of the decision. And this was a case uh, where Justice Spender made an interim order, uh, or dealt with an interim order application. And you'll see that the application for the interim injunction was actually refused in this case. And the reasons are based around what section 4745 means in the context of trying to obtain an interim injunction. The uh, case is relatively short. It's easy to read. You'll see that the counsel for the applicant was Stephen Kime. Now Stephen Kime QC, famous for the um, Hanif trials, and counsel for the respondent, uh, Mr. Tony Morris QC. So some very well-known QCs in the Queensland area litigating that case before Justice Spender. You'll see that um, the order was made on the 13th of December in 2000, and um, the matter was heard, I believe, on that day. So uh, the decision made very quickly, as you would expect when it comes to an interim application for an injunction. Because of the urgency, people need to move fast, and the court makes its decision typically very fast as well. Okay, so what was this case all about? <clears throat> I'm going to stop the share for a moment. Well, it was an interesting case. This is a case about flying fox. And it involved an application by Carol Booth to restrain Ronald Bosworth from engaging in conduct constituting an offence or contravention of the Environmental Protection Biodiversity Conservation Act of 1999. At least that was the argument. What happened is that the applicant, Ms Booth, as a community litigant, sought to restrain another citizen, Mr Bosworth, from what he was doing, essentially arguing that Mr Bosworth was causing or procuring or allowing the death or injury uh, of flying foxes through electrocution or shooting or otherwise. So the application was to prohibit him through an injunction from doing certain things that had that effect. And what, um, uh, what uh, happened is that Mr. Bosworth had assembled a whole series of devices and constructions on his property, which were effectively used for killing flying fox by electrocu electrocu uh, sorry, electrocution. So the court's decision, firstly, in relation to standing, and uh, we'll go back to the case, because you've got to show that you've got, you have the ability to put your foot in the door, as it were. So if we look down to paragraph five of the decision, his honour said that he's satisfied that Dr. Carol Booth did have standing to bring the principal proceedings for the application for the interim injunction relief. It was apparent that the applicant was concerned in the wellbeing of flying fox population in the heritage area a well-known environment for heritage, and Dr. Booth was engaged in the regional policy as the regional policy officer um, and did volunteer work. So what that tells me is this. If you're a community litigant and you want to rely upon that section of the Act, you must initially fulfil the requirements of standing. The court said that Dr. Booth had done that successfully so that would be a good guide as to what your community litigant would have to do from the outset. And you'd want to um, ask questions and include affidavit material about standing issues. The next thing that you'd need to do is consider the legal issue. In order to successfully apply for an injunction, as I mentioned, a party must show good prospects of success as to the substantive matter before the court. Now, in this case, the substantive matter related to um, a contravention of Section 12 of the EPBCA, the argument being that Mr Bosworth was doing something that would have or likely have a significant impact on world heritage values of the heritage area. Now, I'm not sure if His Honour quoted Section 12. Let's see. I think he did. Um, and I'm looking for that now. Otherwise, I could go to Section 12. But um, no, I can't see it there. But in any, oh, there it is. Um, 
here it is. So the question for determination arises from section 12 of the Act, which provides as follows, and you can see that replicated in part six. So the requirements are that a person must not take action that would have a significant impact on world heritage values of a declared world heritage property or likely have significant impact on world heritage values. Um, there are civil penalties um, for both individuals and body corporates, um, even much higher. There are also criminal penalties imposed through the Crimes Act, Commonwealth, Section 4AA. If we look further down this decision of uh, His Honours, paragraph 10 says the central question, which is likely also to be the central question in the principal proceedings, is whether the action satisfied the elements of Section 12 in that it was likely to have significant impacts. Paragraph 16 talks about the evidence. Um, so what this tells me is that you've got to work your way through these issues and this case gives you a really good idea of what the court expects in terms of the evidence presented to it to be satisfied as to the making of an interim injunction. Now, in the end, I said the court did not give the um, order for the interim injunction. But let's have a look at paragraph two, because His Honour has adopted a really good style of judgment writing in accordance with the SIRAC method. You know, remember the old from introduction to law, conclusion, issues, rules, application and conclusion again. So adopting that type of judgment writing, His Honour announced the decision early in the reasons and said, I should say at the outset, for reasons I'll shortly come to, that I'm not going to make the order. The reasons will be quite short. Um, the application is not for final relief. The evidence before me is contentious, has not been tested by cross-examination. The fact that the court does not grant the interim injunction uh, should not mean that this is a rejection of the claim. The object of the intellectual order is to hold the fort or at best keep uh, the least bad way possible until the uh, trial of the action. So that was essentially <clears throat> the decision of Booth and Boswell at first instance. So the first round to Mr. Bosworth, but Dr. Booth didn't stop there. As we had anticipated, the matter did go to final trial, and that was reported in a later decision, uh, which is 2001 FCA 1453. I'll share the screen to show you that. And you'll see here that the court did conclude. Uh, sorry, here we have a very helpful summary. You'll see that sometimes in federal court cases and um, then it goes on to actually make the decision. So the court concluded that it did have a discretion to grant the injunction and the court had limited material and the court concluded that an injunction restraining the operation should be made. So this was, if you like, the next phase of the uh, application where the um, uh, injunction was granted, it was conditional, but it was subject to the approval of the Minister for the Environment, but it was more akin to a permanent injunction rather than the interim injunction that we saw in the first case. What we have here is the actual documentation filed in the case. And this gives you an idea of um, what it was all about. So when you're applying for an injunction, you set out the details of the claim, the claim for relief, and that is the application which was signed by a lawyer. That application is, uh, was supplemented by a statement of claim. And uh, those of you that have done civil procedure probably think uh, we, we would normally expect a claim and statement of claim, but this was an application with statement of claim. And that is the statement of claim that was filed. Uh, it was in fact an amended statement of claim in this matter, um, signed again by the solicitor. So what uh, happens is in the statement of claim, you 
plead the basic elements of the case and outline the overall arguments. Um, well, sorry, outline the, the basic facts that are um, relevant to the case. There we have the amended defence, which was filed on behalf of the um, respondent or the defendant, Mr. Bosworth. And followed, that was followed by the reply. And I know I'm moving through this fairly quickly, but it just gives you an idea of the documents. Then we have the outline of submissions. I mean, we asked for this, I, I certainly asked for this a bit in my examinations. I'll say, prepare an outline of submissions for something. And this is an idea of how you do it. So very formal looking document. You'll see that it's appropriately footnote referenced in accordance with the Australian Guide to Legal Citation. It um, has headings, it's numbered, it's easy to read because it's nicely spaced. It deals with the key issues. Generally, you'd provide for an introduction, then you deal with the substantive issue of standing, argue that there is a serious question to be tried, and talk about why there is a serious question to be tried, refer back to the legislation and the requirements of the Act, that it has or will have or is likely to have a significant impact. And you can see that all of this is supported by case law. It's included, um, it includes quotes from relevant uh, judgments and decisions. You'll see that it all applies to, uh, all deals with the AGLC. It uh, introduces extrinsic material. So those of you that deal with um, statutory interpretation issues will notice Straight away, there's reference to a dictionary. So we're, we're looking at um, extrinsic materials as well as intrinsic materials, referring to case law and essentially setting out an argument. Um, that is a relatively long submission. These days, we try and restrict it to eight pages. But again, that was a submission prepared by Stephen Kime and Chris McGrath, counsel for the applicant on the 12th of December 2000 uh, for the interim injunction. Then we have the outline of submission um, for the applicant, which uh, is similar. And um, if we just scan to the bottom, we'll see that um, that was the application uh, prepared for the, uh, the hearing. Um, then we have the outline of submission for the respondent, which again is in similar form. And that was prepared um, I'm sorry, that was uh, the other, other submissions for the applicant. All right, so you'll see that the next thing I want to talk about is actually going to court. Um, I'll just stop the screen share. Just as a footnote to that decision of uh, Booth and Bosworth, about three years later, one of the farmers applied to the federal court to have the injunction removed. So I mentioned that the interim injunction was denied but the more permanent injunction was, was granted. That sat comfortably for three years until one of the farmers decided to go to the federal court and ask for that injunction to be removed. The matter went before Justice Kiefel, as Her Honour was then in the federal court, now of course Chief Justice, um, and Her Honour said in 2004 that there was no basis for a new trial. There was nothing new that was brought to her attention, uh, to her honour's attention in the matter, and any alleged application of the EPBC Act uh, was a matter that could have been raised in the proceedings initially, um, and they won't bring further proceedings. So what, what the farmers tried to do was sort of attack it from a different angle with a different argument, and essentially that was hosed down, saying, well, you could have raised that, that type of argument initially, and we call that an Anshun estoppel for those of you that have done evidence. Um, and I've had a request to upload these documents on Moodle and, and I'll certainly do that. I wasn't sure if I already had, but um, I will do that. And if I forget, please, please remind me. So that's all very good. And that's an overview of the process of what a community litigant might do if they're applying for an injunction and following through in the federal court. But what if they're going 
to the Planning and Environment Court. What if anyone's going to the Planning and Environment Court? So I'm really making a segue now and I'm away from the federal jurisdiction. I'm back to the state jurisdiction and I'm talking more generally about someone going to the Planning and Environment Court because I want to go through the process with you briefly, um, whether you're acting for a developer or a council or a submitter, you know, a community litigant. So let's share the screen. We'll look at an overview document and you'll see there the Queensland Court's webpage about going to the Planning and Environment Court. Read the material about alternative dispute resolution and um, other things like representing yourself. So the ADR page provides an overview of the ADR process, particularly in relation to the ADR registrar's role and some case management conferences. And you can even look online for the ADR registers online calendar to see when the ADR register is available to undertake a conference or a meeting. But it's very important that you understand that there are practice directions that apply in relation to planning and environment court matters. So if you're involved in any form of PE environment court matters, you've got to be aware of the existence of practice directions and be prepared to follow those directions. I'm just going to bring three to your attention. The first is practice direction number two of 2014. And that deals with case management procedures. And this repealed the previous practice direction from 2001, 2011. So this practice direction basically sets out what you need to do in applying for a directions order, dealing with what's in the directions order, the early referral to ADR registrar and appearances and procedures after the ADR registrar. So it's very important that if you are a litigant, that you are willing to look at the practice directions and they're a great resource because it'll actually give you a very clear idea of what, who does what, when, how, and um, uh, in what form. So it's a very good way of ensuring that you understand the process. Another practice direction that I want to bring to your attention, if this will allow me to go back, is practice direction number seven of 2013, which deals with uh, the issue of ADR, um, and that is early resolution of determination of infrastructure charges is um, important, um, but probably more important in general terms is practice direction number eight of 2014, which deals with the power of the ADR registrar to make orders and issue directions. I'm just going to share, stop sharing the screen. Okay, so we've covered a lot tonight. Um, let me see if I can make, give you a few more hints in terms of uh, the overall assessment. Um, maybe even give you some hints as to what might be included in that essay style question. All right, so thank you very much. I, I hope my internet hasn't been too poor tonight. Um, there have been a few connectivity problems, but thank you, um, Bo, Kim and Justice for staying with the process. So before we wrap up, do you have any questions, comments? There's a request to upload documents on Moodle, so I'll highlight that now. All good? All right. Well, thanks very much for attending. Uh, live, those of you watching the recorded session, all the best. Uh, yes, Kim, did you want to ask a question? Um, yeah, it was just in relation to what we were talking about before um, in regard to Moodle. So, um, yeah, if you were saying if the Moodle site is not um, what I was seeing originally with your screen share, is not what I see. And I know you said about um, a wide screen. Um, there must be some process that we can actually, because um, I know I've had a lot of problems since I've returned to study and since it's gone over to Chrome, Google Chrome, um, there seems to be some incompatibility with 
like I can't get this on my phone anymore for my emails and things like that. So I'm All just right. wondering, um, you know, I, I surely can't be the only person that's had this no. problem. And it's like, um, yeah, it's really difficult because um, the university, they're closed down over the Christmas, which made it worse and there's still people on leave. So I'm assuming that um, it's just a process that we're just going to have to deal with until it can be corrected or waived. Have, have you made contact with TASAC at the university? The technology. Um, yeah, so. I, I did early prior to Christmas because there was already issues um, ever since we joined um, this uh, third semester. Um, but um, again, it's not overly helpful and people go on leave and you don't, you get a reference number, but you don't actually get um, resolutions very promptly and it's usually too late. But and look, I understand that, but um, yeah, it's a little bit difficult. John, I think you've muted yourself. So thanks. Um, I'll try and support you as best I, best I can. I um, have limited ability and resources to help with the technical side of things. I'll refer you to TASAC for that. But if you um, need documents, then please ask, preferably through UCRU. Everyone can see that and as you've been doing, and uh, I will um, uh, go from there. Uh, Justice says, didn't you say you'd give me some tips on the essay question? All right, well, I will shortly. I thought I'd written something down to give you a specific hint. All right, what if I say this? Um, ecological, sustainable development, climate change. I'll write that down. Well yeah. done, I did pick that up. All I'm right. I'm good on justice. Thank you for asking again. Okay. All right, and again, there's no options. It's just one, but I do want everyone to read the course material widely. Okay. All right. Well, we'll wrap up for now. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, we'll continue discussions in you crew and we will see you next week. All the best. Bye then. Thanks, John. John.